this now as a reporter, so I still would like to comment on Pajanis now, even though I'm officially a project manager, but I identify as a journalist. Um, and I'm going to tell you what the engaged journalism accelerator is, um, and some of the findings that we had from our research. This is a new project, so this is one of the um, initial uh, times where we have we actually spoken publicly about the findings. So I'm going to give you a background on the project, going to tell you what we found over the last few months uh, since we've been set up, and also tell you, give you some examples of ways that uh, new organizations in Europe are working with their communities. Um, so I like emojis, by the way, so if someone here doesn't, sorry. Uh, the Engaged Journalism Accelerator is a one and a half um, year program, so it was launched in April, and it, it is run entirely by the European Journalism Centre, which is a non-profit based in the Netherlands. And it has four kind of main pillars. Uh, one of them is grants, so we are giving out funding and grants to uh, European news organizations who are doing this type of engaged journalism. And in the next slide, I will tell you exactly what we mean when we say that. Um, so, between 7 and 15 organizations in Europe will receive funding uh, to do more engaged journalism if they are doing it already, or if someone is moving from an existing advertising based business model, for example, to wanting to work closer, more closer with the readers, both in terms of revenue and collaborating with them, um, that's also uh, a possibility. Uh, so we will be giving out the funding and working with them throughout December 2019. Uh, the other part of the accelerator is events. So we'll be running workshops for journalists in Europe who are, and not just journalists, academics, people in marketing, uh, people in business development, product development, um, anyone who is normally also part of a news organization, but not just the journalists, because we think that when we talk about engaged journalism, it's not something that's a newsroom or redactly a specific uh, thing. It should be an organization-wide uh, endeavor. The other thing will be mentorship and coaching. So uh, for the organizations who receive the grants and also for the, for the wider uh, network of people, we will provide mentorship and coaching in some of the areas that we see the startups like Yakub said are kind of lacking uh, maybe expertise or that's not their focus because these organizations are usually younger, they were funded by really passionate journalists who are really good at what they do and they tend to focus a lot on the reporting and on the journalism but not so much on how to actually make money from it or you know they don't have business development expertise or product development expertise so we want to provide them with that uh, so that you know they, that can go alongside how to actually work with your community and, and what you can do with, with the grants and um, And the last thing is resources, so that will be um, case studies, toolkits, uh, Q&As. Uh, we are uh, running a newsletter which features every two weeks um, a community, an, an interesting experiment from an organization, an organization in Europe that has done work with their community. So in our first newsletter we actually featured uh, matrix organizations, so he will tell you more about it uh, later. Um, but it's just, it doesn't really matter how this kind of work with the community happens. So the organizations that we see are doing this kind of work are um, anywhere between six months old and ten years old. They can be for-profit or non-profit, they can have membership, they can be entirely advertising supported, they can have grants, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the way they work with their communities varies from um, you know, involving them in the reporting, so taking a reader on a reporting trip uh, to help, help them understand better how journalism works and how it's produced and what goes into that, to uh, having a Slack group or a Facebook group for readers to know what kind of story the organization is, is working on and so on. So there are different ways to do what we refer to as engaged journalism. So when we use this term, which it shouldn't be used as a specific type of journalism is not something extra, it should be part of any kind of journalism that we produce, but for the time being, it's still something that we use as a special term. Um, so we, we refer to journalism that empowers communities and their conversations by putting people, readers, viewers, listeners, whatever type of audience, um, at the center of a news organization's ownership. So, for example, a cooperative, when you are a news organization that's a cooperative, uh, people own part of your organization. In the reporting, whether they write for your uh, organization, whether they give you story ideas, whether they leak to you, whatever it might be. In the distribution, um, in the impact, so the kind of impact, you know, the reporting that you are doing, what is the impact that you want that reporting to have on the community and on society as a whole. 
um, and revenue. So this refers to making money from your audience, uh, whether it's you know through subscriptions, memberships, donations. There can be different ways. So in essence, it's engaged journalism is viewing journalism as a conversation and not as a traditional one-sided way that we typically um, seen in the past, and especially like more legacy media organizations, but now that's also starting to change. Not just the one way we publish something and we expect you, the reader, to read it, share it, and care about it. So since the project was set up in April, uh, myself and my team started in, in June, and since then we spent the initial few months doing uh, some research uh, and talking to organizations, both the ones that are doing this kind of work and the ones that are not doing it about why they are doing it, how, and maybe the ones that are not doing it, what are the barriers, um, and if, if they would have the opportunity, what kind of support uh, do they need that maybe we can provide as part of the accelerator, or that we can connect them with um, other people that they can learn from, which, you know, in the essence is exactly like Jakob said, it's knowledge sharing. Um, these organizations don't really know each other, don't communicate with each other, the accelerator is focused on Europe as a whole, so there are so many countries, so many organizations who do really, really good stuff, but they don't have the possibility to reach out to someone who they might want to learn from because either they don't know they exist or you don't have a contact there or it can be a number of So over the last few months, we have uh, built and published a database of more than 70 organizations in Europe who are doing engaged journalism. At the moment, there are 71 from 26 countries. Our goal is to have at least one in each European country, so we are missing quite a few countries. Uh, but hopefully by the end of the, the project, we'll be able to uh, fill that gap. Uh, we have interviewed and surveyed journalists, editors, academics, uh, and other people in these organizations and outside of these organizations about you know, what they need and, the, like I said, the, the challenges in kind of working more closely with their audiences. Um, and we've also visited 11 news organizations in four countries, uh, UK, Spain, France, Greece, um, and Ukraine, to, to learn five countries. I was driving when I did this presentation, in case you can To learn more about the way they work uh, and how the accelerator can, can support them. So these organizations that are younger and they do this kind of journalism is what we, we call early adopters of engaged journalism. So these are just some of the findings uh, from this research. There is a lot more that we will uh, keep sharing and keep having this conversation. Um, I've tried to summarize it very briefly. So one of the things that people kept bringing up is it's, it's hard to first understand what is the, the link between working more closely with your community and actually making money from that. So there is little actual hard data about if you involve your audience, for example, in your reporting, you will be a sustainable news organization. So there's not necessarily enough research in this space and not enough data to convince some people to move to this kind of model. Um, because they see that it's labor intensive and they want basically hard proof that this is worth it. Um, so that's, that's one of them and it's also hard for them to envision longer term of business strategy for their organization uh, towards being financially and also structurally uh, resilient. The, the second one was around experimenting. So we spoke with um, journalists from legacy news organizations who don't necessarily do this kind of engaged journalism every day. They do it maybe sometimes as one of crowdsourcing projects or audience engagement projects. And we asked why is this something that you do only sometimes and it's not part of every story that you do. Um, and experimenting with a different approach or technology is something that they see as a Burden because it's very time and resource intensive. They don't know if it's gonna um, kind of if the outcome is gonna be useful or if they're gonna be able to do anything with it. And it's also hard to convince their managers. If a reporter is, is someone who wants to do this kind of thing, they obviously have to you know talk to their editor and say this is why I'm doing this and this is what we're getting out of it. So sometimes that's also hard. So there are different barriers to experimentation um, as well as like fear of failure, like when we try something new, we don't really want to fail. So sometimes that fear kind of prevents you from actually trying. Um, the third one was that smaller news organizations don't have time to actually go and, and look for these existing resources. So there are lots of tools and case studies and newsletters and reports in, the, in Europe and in the US about the benefits of doing data journalism or how to run an event around elections with your readers or how to do fact-checking with your audience. 
um, but nobody really has the time to go look for them or nobody reads about them every day. We as journalists know about you know some we have cinema lab or we have similar kind of publications that we go to for this kind of knowledge, but day to day journalists who already have so many things to do, that's not something that they do. Um, and then also sometimes it's also the case of journalists are making these efforts to, to bring their users more closely into the journalism and in, into the reporting process, but people like the actual readers or listeners are not really used to this kind of relationship, so they're scared, or they don't feel like their story is worth telling, or they don't, even, even in the Netherlands, and this is a story that someone told me, they were doing a project uh, where they wanted to hear from second generation immigrants in the Netherlands, and they were actively putting out a call to readers to say, we want to hear from you, please share your experiences, talk to us. And there was someone in, in our organization, a, a person who had a really good story, but he wouldn't share it. He just didn't think that it was normal for him to go to a journalist and say, hey, I have something that I want to share. So there's also this kind of mindset that our audiences have that we need to do better work to explain that they should feel comfortable to talk to us as journalists about this and that there is value in it. It should be up to us as the reporters to know if their story is worth telling. Um, and lastly, you know, plenty like most of these challenges are you know shared by anyone who is trying to do this kind of work anywhere in Europe, but there are also some very country specific uh, challenges. For example, uh, having a membership organization where people pay 70 euros a year, for example, to support you uh, is not necessarily something that you can do in Romania, for example. So, willingness to pay for news varies according to the country, it depends on different historical and economical reasons. Um, so, is the interest in supporting an organization who is completely independent. Um, and I, someone here said they were from Rice Project, so I would be interested to hear how that works with Rice Project if people are willing to donate or they understand the idea of a completely independent, politically independent organization because in other countries someone was saying to me, people are so used to being on one side or the other, left wing or right wing, that they don't understand when you're like, no, we are independent, we are doing this for your own good. They're like, no, who sent you? What do you want? What's your interest? It depends to where you go. Because if you go to a state institution, they will say that the other party sent you. But the actual people, like if you go to someone on the street and you explain to them, are they like, I don't believe that you're completely independent, or they mm, take it as a... I think things are changing in Romania, and then it's going really slow, but yeah. people are starting to believe that you are independent, so... Yeah. But it, it's a slow point. Yeah. I was having this conversation with someone in, in Spain, and she was saying the same, they're an investigative journalism organization, and she said it's hard to explain to people that we are completely independent. So this is a screenshot of the database that I mentioned of the 70 organizations. Um, I will send links to this if anyone is interested. So we looked at the different ways that organizations are working with their communities, from financial support to actually participating in decisions, to contributing to reporting, to volunteering, to contributing knowledge. So, I'm going to focus on just three examples because I don't want to run out of time. Um, the first one is, so these are all ways in which organizations are, are trying to get closer to their uh, communities and, and involve them more in the process in different ways. So one of them is keeping a public reporter's notebook. This screenshot is from an organization in the Netherlands called The Correspondent, which is a membership organization that was funded five years ago. Um, and they have 70,000 or just over paying members who pay 70 um, euros a year. So in this screenshot, for anyone who can't read Dutch, I also can't read Dutch, uh, it says their mission. So this lady, uh, Manti, is a correspondent for migration. So she writes about migration for the correspondent. And as a correspondent, it's, you have to, as a journalist employed there, um, constantly work with your readers, so it's part of their contract. So here she has a mission, this is her mission, uh, why she chose this beat, why she chose to write about migration, why that's important to her. And just under it it says what she's currently working on. So this is a public reporter's notebook in the sense that she's constantly updating people on what her current story or investigation is that she's working on. And the point of that is so that people are A, 
aware and it kind of increases trust and, and openness, but also so that they can contact her and say, hey, I saw that you're investigating migration in Nigeria. I suppose that's what it says. Um, I have a story about this. I can actually help you or I have experience with this. And just under it says, sign up for my newsletter for more background and research on my investigations and stories. So once people sign up for the newsletter, that what they get in there is additional content to what's being published uh, on the correspondence website. So you know notes that maybe she took on reporting trips, uh, images, audio, um, background information, and she's constantly prodding people to contact her and and tell her about their experiences with this particular topic that she's working on at the time. So during this kind of experiment, it's not very time intensive. Um, it just means that you put a status on your website basically telling people what you're working on and I know it can be slightly trickier sometimes when you work on investigations, you can't really bring everyone in and say, hey, come and help us investigate corruption or something. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to know everything, but just so that people are aware of what you are currently working on and, and then five months later when you publish, you don't just go, oh, we didn't really know and we had something that we could have shared with you. Um, the second example is from a small local organization in France called Rue 89 in Strasbourg. Um, and they do, they are a team of four people full time working there, they're very small, and they do about four or five events a month with their community in Strasbourg. And they have different types of events. The one that I highlighted here, um, Connected Neighborhoods, they basically do a public newsroom. In, each, in a different neighborhood each month. So they go there as two or three journalists and they invite people from the community to attend and, and tell them you know, what are some of the local issues that are happening here in your, in your neighborhood. They can have something to do with education or the trash is not being picked up or I don't know, there is, uh, it, can, it can be anything. So just kind of opening up this process to people and saying we want to hear what your concerns are and what your information needs are as opposed to us telling you what you should know. So based on that, that's how they get feedback for their current reporting, that's how they get um, story ideas. So they actually follow up on, on the leads with people themselves, so with the readers themselves. They, they report on the stories that people are suggesting. And this helps a lot because first of all you get to interact with people on a kind of human personal level and they also understand more about what actually goes into making a story both in terms of the research process, the writing it and what kind of money goes into it, how much does it cost to actually produce a story or an investigation. Um, and this is really important because Rue 89 also has like a correspondent, they have a subscription so they are asking people for money and you can't really be that successful like getting money from people if they don't understand who you are, what you do, why you do it, how you work, and how you are spending their money, basically. Because the impression from the outside could be that they have so much money, why are they asking you to give you know, 10 euros a month or something? Because they, people don't understand how much it actually costs to run an organization and how much goes into producing a story. Um, and the last example is from uh, an organization in the UK. It's called Bureau Local and it's part of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. They are one or two years old, um, and they are also a very small team of five. And they do collaborative investigative journalism. Uh, they collaborate as a team with local reporters across the UK, but they also collaborate with uh, the public. So the way that they do this is they are mostly, their background is mostly in data journalism and investigative journalism. So for example, they have investigated uh, local budgets in the UK. So they first uh, set up to compile a data set from existing uh, public data sources. And once they have that data set about budgets from everything that you can find online, then they organize a hackathon, basically a one-day event in different cities across the UK. And they invite people. It doesn't matter what background they have, it doesn't matter if they can work with data or not. Most people never had any anything to do with data. And they spend one day, first of all, explaining what the data is and why they are doing this. And then people start looking into the data themselves. So they help clean it, they help organize it, scrape it, they help um, look for stories in the data. So this is, and they get, this is the skill sharing that I, that I mentioned there is. Journalists are teaching the public how to do data cleaning and how to actually look for stories in the data. 
but the people are the ones who are living in Bristol or I don't know Edinburgh or London or whatever. So they also know what they're looking for, and they may, might not have any background in journalism or data, but they care about what happens with their money or with voting in their local council elections or whatever. Um, so so far, your local has done I think two or three updates. One was uh, around the UK elections to do their own reporting, and they give them coaching and they explain how to do a story. So if someone says I want to investigate. Um, I don't know, the spending of, on public uh, schools in my particular neighborhood or in my city, then they can apply for a grant and your local will, will give them a small amount of money to do this reporting and work with them to teach them how to do it. So these are just three examples. Uh, there are a lot more highlighted in the database and a lot more that we hope to talk about and find out about over the next year. Uh, and <coughs> So yeah, if you have any questions, comments, or complaints about my emojis, you can talk to me, you can email me, uh, tweet me, or yeah, anything. Thank you.